So we have looked at the authorization code flow, which, as I said, is the most canonical way to do OAuth 2. But we also saw that there are a lot of modular parts with OAuth 2, and people have already been talking about the implicit grant, um, and native applications, and all of these different variables that don't really match the diagrams that we had up before. So one of the goals with OAuth 2 was to build a system that was flexible enough that we could actually manage all of these different kinds of client applications, these different kinds of services, and connect them together using the same core set of pieces and technologies. So we're going to start with the implicit flow. Now, a lot of people here have been talking about single-paged applications and how you use the implicit flow. Um, and this is where the implicit flow started. The idea was that the authorization code flow separates the browser from the client. But if the browser is the client, or the client is running inside the browser, then why bother with that separation? Like, let's just do everything through the front channel, and it'll just work. So instead of redirecting and then coming back with an auth code and then talking to the authorization server, you redirect and come back with an access token and just go on with your day. The idea here was that in 2010 to 2012, when OAuth 2 was being ratified, it was very difficult for JavaScript-based in-browser applications to uh, do things like call a back-channel API. Cores had not been invented yet. Right? Post message was not a thing. Like, there's a lot of stuff that's changed since then. There are two big problems with the implicit flow. The first is that because everything's going through the front channel, you lose a lot of the protections that the back channel gives you. You no longer have a way to do a client secret or do a um, you know, TLS bound request or anything like that. But if everything really is running inside the browser, not as big of a deal. The biggest problem with the implicit flow, though, is that it's easy. So developers will take a look at all of the different OAuth grant types, which, by the way, as somebody brought this up during the break, when I say flow and I say grant type, they mean the absolute same thing. Flow is the more sort of historical language. Grant type is the sort of official specy language that the editor came up with and confused everybody. Um, they are the same thing. So when you're doing an implicit-based grant, um, it's really easy because you don't have to deal with this auth code. You don't have to make this extra call. There's fewer round trips. People really, really, really like this, which means that you can take a non-web um, browser application and try to run the implicit flow with it, and it'll work. But the implicit flow was built with a lot of the assumptions that this is all going to be running inside of a browser. You're going to be protected with same origin policies. You're going to be protected with cookie lifetimes. You're going to be protected with all of this other stuff. And then things like local storage got invented. And um, browsers started keeping the fragment oh, um, across redirects and uh, occasionally sending it to back channel servers. Thank you, Google. And um, doing all sorts of weird things that we did not anticipate. And people started building native applications and realizing that, oh, hey, my native application, I can't really deal with client secrets and all this stuff, so I'm just going to use the implicit flow. This means, however, that you're no longer protected by any of the things that made the implicit flow work somewhat reasonably. These days, we have a lot of single-page applications. This has come up a few times uh, already today. We have a lot of single-page applications. This is how people are building web apps. We're no longer really building traditional web apps where you put an, HTTP or an HTML form up and then submit the form and then get new HTML. Right? We're not really building that kind of system as much anymore. So it's tempting, in a lot of cases, to do all of the OAuth right in the front channel, 
with the implicit flow and store your tokens there. And a lot of people that I talk to also say that, okay, we've got our SPA and we're calling the backend system, so that means I need to get an access token. Well, not really. Because you think about what OAuth is actually trying to solve. It's trying to really get you to a third-party API. If you have a first-party website that is serving your SPA application and hosting your APIs, we have well-understood, well-scoped technology to protect this. Cookies. Like, seriously, you send a cookie out when you serve the application, and then you keep using that cookie when it talks to the API that's coming from the same origin. Your browser just does this. You don't even have to tell it to. OAuth really only comes into play when the front end needs to make a direct call to a third-party back channel that's on a different origin and you can't use cookies or don't want to use cookies. That's when OAuth in the front end really, really makes sense. But think of how most of us are building our single-page applications. They're not pure JavaScript applications that are totally stateless or whatever and just live in the browser, are they? Our single-page applications are split. There's a back-end system with a bunch of APIs that only speak to that SPA, and then there's all the stuff on the SPA that, that makes things run. So a bit of best practice here, and this is one of the things that's in that best practice document, is some of the best practice for using OAuth with an SPA is to not use OAuth with your SPA, right? Instead, use normal session management to tie your SPA to the back half of the SPA. And then if that needs to go talk to a third-party thing, guess what? You now have a web server talking to another web server. You can use the authorization code flow to do that. Furthermore, new technologies have been added to the OAuth ecosystem that make it even less um, desirable to use the implicit flow because we have the Pixie protocol, which we'll go into in a bit, which was originally made for native applications. But if you combine Pixie with cores and a couple of other things, maybe even post messages, you can actually do a full authorization code flow from inside of a browser today. You could not do that in 2012. It was technologically impossible. But today you can. And it's not even that hard. And it's also the case that you don't really need to a lot of the time. So my best advice for using the implicit flow now in 2019 is to stop. Wow, that was, I did, I'm going to pretend I meant to do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> to stop using it. Uh, in most cases, uh, you're either mischaracterizing how your application works, because it's probably a split SPA with a back-end system that can handle your security tokens, or you're not calling a third-party API from the front channel to begin with, in which case, you don't actually need OAuth because you're not doing delegation across sites. Um, or you can just do the auth code flow with Pixie and solve that problem that way. So the best advice of the community is really coming down to not using the implicit flow and instead using one of these other alternatives. The reason for this is that the implicit flow has a lot of security issues with token injection, with uh, uh, hijacking and fixation attacks. Um, there's a lot of problems with it. When we wrote it uh, as part of the spec, we decided to like, write this down, write down the problems with it, and hopefully people would heed the warnings. Didn't really happen that way. More on uh, problems with the front channel, incidentally, again, in my talk this afternoon on transactional authorization and what we can do about that. All right, so what if I don't have a user at all? OAuth is a delegation protocol. What if I'm not actually delegating? 
Why on earth would I want to do this? Well, that confused the first OAuth, the OAuth 1 authors uh, a lot because it wasn't a case that was even considered. When we got around to OAuth 2, we realized that people were, were doing this, that we really wanted a system where a client could access a protected resource kind of on its own. In other words, it's an API key. I've got software that's not acting on behalf of any particular user. Why on earth would I want to deploy this? Why wouldn't I just use, why would I want to deploy OAuth here? Why wouldn't I just want to use an API key? Well, when you're doing the client credentials grant in OAuth, what happens is the client presents what is effectively its API key, but it does so to the authorization server. That API key is not known by the protected resource. It's known by the auth server. The client then gets an access token, which it can then go call the protected resource. This drastically simplifies deployments because now only one component in your system needs to know about your software API keys, and that's the auth server. Your resource servers, your APIs, API gateways don't need to know any of that, which is a really, really big one. The other thing is that at the APIs, <coughs> Well, if I'm doing API keys for non-delegated access, but I'm doing OAuth tokens for delegated access, that's two entry points that I now have to deal with. That's way more than I want to deal with. So if I do this, then this means that as the API developer, I can simply look at the access token coming in, and I get to ask the same question every time. I have a token. What is it good for? I don't have to worry about, um, you know, did, is this a user coming in directly? Is this software? I could just get this token, and I can look up, does this token represent a user? Does it represent a, a bulk process of some type? I can just figure out what the token is good for, which is something I need to do anyway. Now comes a really fun one. This is the resource owner password flow. In this one, the user gives their credentials, to the application, which has asked nicely. And it then replays those to the authorization server along with its own credentials and gets an OAuth token to call the protected resource. Anybody see why this might be a little weird? We have effectively codified the stealing the credentials flow. Why would we do that? One of the main reasons so we knew that people were going to do it anyway. <laughs> this, and this is all in a public, this argument is all in public email archives. Um, we knew that people were going to try to pull this anyway, because people were already trying to pull this with OAuth 1, even though it really didn't work there. So the idea here was to write down a pattern to do this, a very limited pattern to do this, that would allow us to say, you know what? Um, you can, you're allowed to have a username and a password, and that's it. No MFAs, no extra bits and fields and stuff like that. And you have to send those along with a client credential. And this has to be a very highly trusted first party application because it's stealing the credentials. And you need, to, because in this case, you need to know that your client software is not going to keep those credentials when it doesn't need it anymore. So you want your client software to, if it's doing the right thing, it will hand those on the way through, but then it doesn't need to keep them to keep calling the API. It can throw those out. It can get rid of those and you get an access token and maybe even a refresh token along with it. So I don't have to keep prompting the user for their password. As far as the user is concerned, they logged into the application and it just works. In the back end, you have an opportunity to do the right thing and get rid of the user's credentials and move forward. That said, this was meant to be a stepping stone for people to go from um, direct authentication to the API to an authorization delegation based system and move people in the OAuth ecosystem forward. Because at least the protected resource doesn't need to know the user's password anymore, so that's great. The problem here is that a lot of people have decided to build their house on a stepping stone, which is not the most architecturally sound decision. And, um, so there's a lot of effort now to move people off of this, especially as we get to identity systems that are not simple username and password anymore. 
And when you have something that is more complex, like the question you asked before about how does the user authenticate, this is the one place where OAuth actually cares about that. Um, and if you're not doing a simple username and password, you really should be sending the user in a browser to do something else. The biggest pushbacks I've, ha I've um, had from companies when I go to talk to them about this is that they want to control the user experience. They don't like opening browser uh, tabs or panels or anything like that. There are tools on pretty much all platforms today to make this nearly seamless to use the authorization code flow. And a pro tip to everybody in the audience, if you are developing an OAuth application on Android or iOS, Google's open source app auth library is absolutely the best way to go. Um, it's, a, it's effectively a system level library on both platforms that just does the right things. It does the authorization code flow, it has Pixie built in, uh, it allows you to manage refresh tokens, it is absolutely the best way to go um, if you're building new. Now, we're going to talk about assertions. This is applicable largely if you bought a giant server from Microsoft and they're making you use it. Um, because an assertion is a signed document that says what it is good for. And Sort of classical security systems, everything is based around this. So SAML is all about creating this assertion and getting it around. The SAML stands for, um, you know, it's the simple assertion markup language. So SAML is about creating documents. It's not about sending them around. There are protocols, SAML protocols for sending these documents around, but that's just to really get them from A to B. Ultimately, it's about the signed assertion. WS Trust, if you're unfortunate enough to have to deal with that, that's all about assertions. The assertion flow allows you to bridge between those types of systems and an OAuth-based system. So if you're doing RESTful APIs or Graph APIs or anything like that, the assertion flow lets you take in an assertion and translate that to an OAuth token that you can then use uh, back in your backend system. This means that your APIs don't have to deal with the assertions. This means that your clients don't have to deal with the assertions beyond just replaying them. So there are uses for this, uh, for token exchange and things like that. This makes a lot of sense if you need to bridge these worlds because it lets you get into the OAuth space. And then there's the device flow. This is a fun one because not every application can pop open a web browser. Think of your set-top boxes. Think of your Internet of Things stuff. So if anybody here has like smart socks on, it probably doesn't have a fully featured interactive web browser. And if it did, it doesn't have your regular login sessions on it. So try to do MFA through your socks. I'm sure somebody has a good idea how to do that. I'm not, but we won't go there. The whole idea behind the device flow is that really, we still want the user to interact at the AS, but our front channel is now kind of broken in half. So the user is going to show up in a browser, but I can't send them there directly. What I can do is I can tell them, go to this URL and enter this code. So the device, the client, is going to go talk to the auth server. It's going to get a code and communicate that code to the user somehow. It's going to display it on the TV. It's going to speak it through a speaker, whatever. Get that information to the user. The user then gets on their phone or on their laptop or whatever, logs in like they always do, goes to this static URL and says, this is the code that I was given. Meanwhile, the device is going to be pinging the server saying like, hey, um, you know, that, that time that I asked for a code, has that been approved yet? And from a user's perspective, they get a code, they enter it in, it magically starts working. This is just, uh, this is, um, actually forget, I think this is finalized as an RFC now. If not, it is really darn close. Um, because this has actually been in production since like 2011. Um, and it's just now getting an RFC. Um, which gives a little bit of insight into how the standards process works. And incidentally, if you would like, uh, 
Uh, if any of you are interested in watching me go on a 20 minute rant about the standards process, I gave that talk at the predecessor to Identiverse a couple of years ago. Uh, go to YouTube and search for So You Want to Run a Standards Group. It's a fun time, lots of Legos. Um, so now let's talk about native applications, all right? So what do I mean by native app? It's something that runs on the end user system. Uh, actually, before I get into native apps, do people have questions about these different flows specifically? Okay, there's a few. Yes, sir. What, sorry? How is it different from an OTP? Um, because an OTP is going to be generated by the device, and in this case, the code is actually generated by the authorization server and handed to the device to communicate to the user. So it is a one-time password, but it's not oath or any of, it's not TOTP or anything like that. Um, so. So does it, in this case, Sorry. Yes, the devices are still OAuth clients. They still have client IDs and everything associated with that. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, that's, so the question is about user context um, between the different flows. And a lot of it boils down to how you can get the user to interact when you need them to. Um, and so you can do that um, with redirects. You can do that by prompting them to go somewhere, or you can not involve them at all if you're doing um, you know, uh, the assertions flow or something like that. Um, when the user is present, the, their context with the authorization server is managed by the authorization server. So how they authenticate, how that gets presented. Um, OAuth just cares that it happens. It doesn't necessarily care how. All right, I've got time for like two more, so go ahead. One question here. I see how everything flows up from the device and from the resource owner into the auth server. Yes, sir. I see, uh, but I don't see anywhere where a, a device flows come back in any direction, either to the resource owner, to the device, or to the device and out to the... Okay, so um, yeah, I was, I was going very quick through this. So the way that this really happens, you turn on the device, it says, I don't have an access token. It's gonna go talk to the authorization server and get what's called a device code and a user code. It's gonna hold on to the device code and then it's gonna communicate the user code to the user. Uh, the user in the meantime is gonna go get on a different computer, go type it in. The device is gonna keep pinging with that device code at the authorization server, never communicate that to the user. So that keeps going back and forth. And then, uh, then eventually the user's gonna type something in at the auth server, and the auth server's gonna say like, oh, this user code matches this device code, this is now authorized, that device code's gonna come back and basically say like, yes, you're good, here's your access token, stop bugging me, go on with your day. I was just looking at that, looking for the flow backwards. So yep, it's yeah, it, it's, uh, this is poll based. Is, okay. Yeah, it's, it's implied that it's poll based. Um, and, uh, and again, more thought onto like what this means and where this is going. As you may have uh, picked up on, that is a highly transactional kind of thing because we're polling for a transaction state. Again, I'm going to be talking about that this afternoon. Uh, there was one over here. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. What is the life expectancy of that token? Oh, life expectancy of, I'll, I'll expand your question to life expectancy of tokens in general. So, uh, so in OAuth 1, tokens didn't necessarily expire at all. Um, the assumption was that once you approved it, it was approved until you said that it wasn't approved anymore. In OAuth 2, we built in the concept of tokens being able to automatically expire. And like I was saying before, uh, when you're building out your API, you really need to decide how long you want that access token to live for. Because uh, if you're set up such that your client is only accessing it for a few minutes, then you don't want your token living hours or days or whatever. Refresh token, on the other hand, is basically, um, the guideline is how long do you trust that client to keep that refresh token safe, right? So the lifetime of that uh, tends to be much longer, even to the point where they don't necessarily expire on their own. Best practices, the, uh, best practices for refresh tokens, not something that is strictly codified. There are a lot of profiles of OAuth that do dictate uh, appropriate lifetimes uh, for things like, say, refresh tokens are good for 
12 hours in certain circumstances and two weeks in other circumstances. And it, it, and it gives that, uh, that contextual best practice. So generally, though, what you see is refresh tokens live forever until the client is revoked. If you have that case, though, it is also considered best practice to rotate your refresh token as soon as it gets used. So, um, so as soon as somebody uses it, you hand out a new one to whoever used that old one um, so that you don't have a very, very, very long-term credential out there. The question is, uh, the client APIs can uh, be swapped for uh, two-way SSL. Talk to that guy about OAuth MTLS. <laughs> uh, we're actually going to cover that a little bit later. So that's Brian Campbell, uh, distinguished engineer or something like that. If ping something like that. Uh, some fancy title. Um, uh, so he's uh, the editor of a draft that is uh, currently being finalized, we hope, uh, in the IETF right now about how you do uh, mutual TLS on OAuth. Um, we're going to cover that very briefly at the uh, end of this talk. Um, but uh, you know, Brian is actually the editor of that. I'm not just picking on him. So uh, some really good work that's doing there. I've built and deployed it. It's, it's good stuff. So native clients. When I say native client, I mean something that's running on the end user system. It's not running on a back end uh, web server. It's not running inside of the system browser. Now, this gets really blurry with things like uh, you know, Apache Cordova, where you are building native applications using web technologies. Those are still native applications because they're kind of in their own little sandbox. They're in their own little bubble. They're not running in a browser tab they, um, that is part of the system browser, even though they're using HTML to draw things. Um, so what makes a native app different? Functionally, it lives completely outside the browser in that the user is not interacting with the native app by going through their browser, unlike a web server, unlike an SPA. And it also can't keep secrets from the user at all. So if I... Uh, so a lot of you are familiar with this notion, and we talked about the, a little bit the client secret. So you see this in OAuth. This is how the client most commonly identifies itself to that authorization server. So if I have a client secret, and I built it into my client application, and I put my application into the App Store with my client secret, and a million people download my application, how secret is my client secret? It's not. We're just pretending. In OAuth 1, there was no way around it. Every client had to have a client secret. In OAuth 2, we at least admitted that there were these things called public clients that couldn't have secrets that were generated at configuration time. The other th thing, so that has some implications. More on that in just a bit. The other thing is that it requires some interesting tricks in order to use redirects and get calls back in the front channel. So let's deal with these one at a time. First off, like I just said, if I install my application all over the place, if I'm building this in sort of a traditional naive way, I'm giving everybody the copy of the same secret. I shouldn't be using a client secret at all. Now, my deployment system might be able to give a per instance secret that I can then um, hand to uh, each individual instance of the application. That's something. But I could also use something called dynamic client registration. Now, dynamic client registration basically means when the app wakes up, the first thing it says is not, do I have an access token? It, in fact, says, do I even have a client identifier? Do I have an identity as an application? And if not, it can go talk to the authorization server at runtime and get a client ID and maybe even a client secret. Or it can register a key that it generates. Now, this is a secret that is not hidden from the user. But think about it with native applications. What does that even mean? You now have a secret that is only on one instance of an application, and it is only available and leaking to that one user. So I can screw up my own app, but I could do that without OAuth's help. right? I cannot screw up your instance of an application because it has a different secret identifier. It has a different key set. 
The downside of dynamic client registration is you now have to manage lots and lots and lots of instances of clients. And because OAuth is a very client-centric uh, model, this can be uh, sometimes problematic at scale. Doable, absolutely, but uh, there is a trade-off there. Like I said, uh, you can have things where clients have an ID and just don't have a secret at all, which becomes problematic when we get to the next bit. Because redirect URIs are another big issue with native applications. So I can have a custom URI scheme. So, you know, my app colon whatever. And this works with OAuth because the auth server is going to send the redirect to the system browser. And the auth server doesn't have to be able to dereference this. The user's browser does. When the user's browser sees this URI, their OS is going to say, oh, this means I launch this application and hand it this input string. This is how we do stuff with, um, with cross-application calling on mobile platforms all over the place today. Um, you could also spin up an HTTP web server, run something on localhost, local use that at runtime. A handful of people have done that. Or you could even do a truly remote application and use push notification to get back to the single instance of the client. This is one of those things that is technically possible, but I don't, there's not a lot of benefit from doing this. But I bring it up because it, it is allowable. Far and away the most common, though, is a redirect URI with a custom scheme or a captured remote URI which has the same properties. The problem, though, is that when the, when the application gets installed, it basically says, hi, any URLs that go to my app, colon, whatever, send them to me. Well, there's nothing stopping uh, Joel here from writing an application that says, oh, wait, no, 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 no. When you get my app, send it to me instead. So if you're doing an authorization code flow and you've dynamically registered, you're probably still fine because if my app starts something and Joel intercepts that callback, he's going to send that authorization code back to the auth server and it's not going to work because he doesn't have my client secret. He doesn't have the bits that he needs to finish that and get the access token. Except that, as we were just talking about, it's really hard to have a client secret or equivalent with a public native application, which means that we have a bit of a perfect storm of problems here. Because if I go through and I have a public client, I send it back and forth. Joel builds his malicious application. And he doesn't have to start the request. He just has to listen to the response. Because my public client ID is something that he'll know. So he'll be able to take that and the authorization code that he got in, and he'll be able to just replay that directly and get my access token. Not the best situation, to say the least. So what do we do about it? Well, we're going to use pixie magic. Proof key for code exchange, pronounced as pixie, is an RFC extension to OAuth and proof that you shouldn't let nerds pick names for things. Um, Pixie is a very simple and elegant protocol for use of public clients using the authorization code flow. So what happens is the client generates a random secret called the code verifier, and it holds on to it. When it sends the browser out, it's going to include a hash of that code verifier. Now, the hash of the code verifier uh, is called the code challenge. That gets sent to the authorization server. The authorization server is going to remember that when it creates the authorization code. And when the authorization code comes back, the client then sends the code verifier, that original secret. So the auth server, remember, this is in the back channel. This is the auth code flow. So the auth server then looks at the verifier that came in, recalculates the hash, and compares that to what it saw on the front channel. A very, very simple operation for both client and auth server 
that now protects us because if Joel steals my auth code, like he can even steal, uh, you know, he can watch my redirects and he can s potentially steal my code challenge on the way out, but he can't steal my code verifier because that's a direct HTTP connection. And getting on that, which is again TLS protected, that's a harder attack surface. So the malicious application can't send the verification for this. This is effectively a one-time use client secret that the client generated just for this purpose. In other words, it's a transactional binding secret. The reason I keep coming to this transactional language is that this is where I personally feel a lot of the OAuth world is going. We're having all of these different sort of add-ons that are pushing OAuth in this direction to solve these very real problems. So we've talked about all of these different use cases, all right? And, oh, yes. Okay, so the question is, what, it, what is to stop the malicious actor from generating the original challenge and then stealing the code? Well, then they're not stealing the code, they're getting their own code. That's just them pretending to be my app and fooling the user. Uh, the, the attack that we're trying to prevent is the user starting in the legitimate application and then having the access token go somewhere else. We're not trying to stop the attack of somebody impersonating your application. Different, different set of issues. Also very hard to deal with. Yes? So dynamic registration, so the question was uh, uh, Pixie versus dynamic registration. So dynamic registration allows you to do um, a lot more with your client. You can register keys. You can um, uh, you know, uh, use software statements to tie instances of the application together and stuff like that. It's a much more rich protocol. And if you can manage it on the AS side, it gives you a lot more power and a lot more control um, than just Pixie. So you can use uh, you know, client assertions to authenticate the instances instead of just this Pixie hash. Um, Pixie is a lot simpler. It doesn't uh, require uh, additional sort of client management and tooling on the AS side, and it also doesn't, uh, doesn't require the client to do much beyond just having uh, that ac one extra little hash. Yes. Yes, sir. Was that? Why not both? It's fine with me. So Pixie really makes the most sense with public clients. If you're doing dynamic registration, you're probably not gonna have a public client anymore. But if you wanted to do it, you can. And in fact, there are profiles that say you, you should do that even with a non-public client as well. Um, yes, sir. Uh, Pixie is hash-based, so it is, it's symmetric. Yes. Yes, yes, it's a hash. It is not asymmetrical, it is symmetrical, it is a hash. Yes. That is correct, sir. Okay. All right. Yes? My understanding is the guidance is to forego the implicit flow in favor of uh, authorization code grant in Pixie. Yes. But in Pixie or DINREG, probably Pixie. So we're talking about this past, you know, SPA scenario here, and so it's still browser. And uh, so when you generate the code verifier, Mm -hmm. You still have to do the full redirect. Yep. And you have to start the original value somewhere. Mm -hmm. and so it basically still makes it vulnerable for somebody to look up, to store it in local storage, right? Yep. To pick it up from the local storage and then use it. Yep. So the question is um, you know, if you're doing an SPA and doing full redirects and everything and you're generating all of this stuff in the browser, uh, you are still vulnerable from people stealing your application state out of local storage or anything like that on the way back, absolutely. Which is why you probably don't want to be building your SPA as a fully stateless in-browser SPA. And you probably want to have a uh, back-end split component to do that for you. So keep stuff out of the browser when you can. Let the browser do browsy things. Um, so this is a chart which as you can see is now a little bit out of date. Um, there are cases where 
the implicit flow still does make some sense, but those are very quickly going away. And um, really, what I want you guys to get out of this, though, is start up in that upper left corner on this flow chart. Right? What does it say there? Does it say, are you building this in JavaScript? Is your API RESTful? No. It says, are you acting on behalf of a user? Acting on behalf of. Who are you delegating for? Fundamentally, OAuth 2 is a delegation protocol. And that's where your decision tree really needs to go. Right? You need to start there. And from there, everything else is figuring out how you're delegating. Because if you're not delegating on behalf of a user, then maybe, maybe it's just the client acting on its own behalf, or maybe you got a third-party authorization. If you are delegating on behalf of a user, how are you able to interact with them? Can you do a full redirect? Can you chirp out a code? Like, what are your options? Um, if you really, really hate security, you can do the resource owners flow. I mean, that's an option. Please don't. Um, and if you're doing the authorization code flow, which should be your default uh, for just about every application, you know, do you need to add these other modules, Pixie and dynamic registration? When you are approaching a problem that you think OAuth might be the solution for, start by asking yourself, can I solve this with the authorization code flow? Right. Can I build this using the authorization code flow? Does that make sense? Not, do I feel like doing it? Because implicit's so much easier. No, can I do it? Is it possible? If so, start there and then build out from there. 